Ah, Persia. A nation with rich culture and history and art. Already a very strong nation in EU4, but now more powerful than ever. Hey there, my name is Provis, and welcome to more Europa Universalis 4. Today we are getting an early preview of an upcoming DLC on November 6th called King of Kings, which reworks the entirety of the Iranian area and a lot of the Middle East, including new mission trees for the Koyunlus, Arnabil, several Persian miners, the Mamluks, and our beloved Byzantium. All of that is obviously very exciting, but today I am collaborating with Paradox specifically to show off one of many different flavors of Persia that you can experience in the new DLC. Now you might think that I'm gonna start my game with one of the nations that got some new mission trees and other mechanics, Artabil obviously being the Chad option, but instead we are replaying as the Timurids. Oh, but promise, didn't you know that the Timurids are forbidden from forming Persia in EU4, you dingus? Well, not anymore, they're not. The Timurids can, in fact, form Persia. And my goal, actually, is to form Persia as quickly as possible so we can mess with a few fun little mechanics. So while we are starting off very strong, albeit a bit unstable, let's give the Timurids a try. And yes, we will be playing in Iron Man mode. If I can get myself some achievements along the way, hey, why not? Now on paper, the Timurids seem very powerful. They are already considered to be one of the world's great powers. We have five different vassals in Fars, Khorasan, Transoxiana, Afghanistan, and Sistan. However, we are also extremely weak at the moment because, uh, well, <clears throat> we have very high liberty desire from all these subjects. They are only being held in check by our current ruling Shah. Once he dies, a 50% penalty will be inflicted on these vassals, and they're almost certainly going to try to break free. If you cannot stabilize your position quickly, the Timurids fall apart within the first few years of the game. There are some steps we can take, though. I'm going to go ahead and go to our ICTA government type and pass lenient taxation to get more diplomatic reputation and reduce their liberty desire. We're also going to go to our estates and make sure we pick up that strong duchies modifier for another minus 10%, plus two more diplomatic relations. And I want to hire up my free company to get more units so I can kind of put down the liberty desire of my vassals, but we don't have enough cash. That's eh, fine. That's where the monopolies come into play. Let's go ahead and hand off something like, I don't care, paper. That's fine. And we are not going to rival the Mamluks back. Why? Because if we do that, the Mamluks are very likely to support the independence of Transoxiana, giving them a huge boost in liberty desire and drawing the Mamluks into a war I don't want to fight yet. Speaking of fighting, the typical strategy you go for as the Timurids is to literally declare war on Ajam as quickly as you can, which is going to be December 11th, because Ajam holds a lot of my cores. In fact, their entire nation should be something we can annex in one war if I want to, and I do. So literally, as soon as we hit December 11th and I'm allowed to declare wars again, what we're going to do real quick is set these guys to my rivals and save rival me, bunch of idiots, and then declare war for one of our cores in a reconquest war. Uh, Abarka or Semnon make a lot of sense. Why do you want to declare war immediately? Because your vassals cannot declare independence if they are already in a war. So by declaring war and then staying at war until we are stabilized, we know they're not gonna go anywhere. Now, a very important thing you need to do, go to your subjects and tell them all to go on either aggressive or siege mode. Spend their own manpower and troops sieging down your enemies. Let them be weak while you sit back and watch. The weaker your vassals are, the less likely they will be able to rise against you when the Shah dies. Now, while I fight this war and draw things out as much as I can, let's take a look at something. You'll notice here, there is no form Persia option. Oh no, you were an idiot, I was right. No, 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 I made the same mistake too. For whatever reason, we are considered to be Uzbek in our culture. We need to be Iranian. So if I want to form Persia, I'm going to have to do a culture swap. And the good news is we're about to pick up a lot of Persian culture. However, that does mean we're going to need to revoke a few states in order to make this work. So it's not terrible, but it'll take a little finagling. I'm going to be forming Persia as aggressively as I can, because once we do, not only do we get a new, massive, very powerful mission tree, but there's also some special things we can do, like, oh, I don't know, become a Zoroastrian nation? And the Shah is already dead. Okay, that usually does happen very early on. But again, even though I now should be in a situation where I'm going to have some pretty terrible liberty desire, and this really is atrocious, we're okay, because we're at war. They're not going anywhere. 
Now at this point, with 96% war score and a call for peace, I do want to be done with this. We actually have just enough war score. I can full annex a jam right now, and all of these are cores for me, so this is very easy. But before we do this, let's go ahead and declare our war against Baluchistan, because, as you might expect, I do not want even a very brief moment where my vassals could break free if they want to. But now we'll go ahead and ask for peace, and I will take all of this. Thank you. Fun little side effect, by the way, of taking all of Ajam at once. We now get Ardalan and we get Luristan as vassals as well. Weird, right? The problem, of course, being that now, technically, my vassals are a little bit stronger. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's a small issue. Now, I want to turn a lot of this stuff into states, since it is all free. But remember, Persian needs to take the priority here. So something like over here, for example, we'll go ahead and turn this immediately into a state because it only gives me Persian. This is already a state, and I think that's actually about all we're going to get out of this area for the moment. So with these three states turned into territories, we now can go over here and spend some Diplo power to turn this into a Persian empire. Boom. And with this now accepted, we can restate everything as much as I want to, but the most important thing is, look at this. We can form the Persian nation. All right, so we need to time this carefully. Uh, Sistan is the larger of the vassals I want to annex. So this one's going to cost me seven per month. We don't have a ton of diplo power, but it's fine. Done in November of 1455. I want to time this to try to finish it at the same time as annexing Afghanistan which is off by just a few months, and then follow that up with Transoxiana to finish around the same time. Now, one thing you may notice, annexation will be instantaneous with Transoxiana, also with Coruscant, also with Fars. Why? Because we have cores on all of their territory. So if we time this correctly, I can annex all three of these within a very short time frame. Okay, so now it says that I can annex Afghanistan in November of 1455, so now we're working on both of these. This does mean we're going to start draining our Diplo power very quickly, but I'm fine with that. Hey, by the way, something I want to point out that's awesome in this DLC, a lot of quality of life changes, including notifications for such things as, hey, you have a center of trade that could be upgraded, or hey, you have an expensive edict that's been doing nothing for a long time. Things that I've really wanted in the game are finally here, it's great. Huh, I'm not sure what's changed here. All of a sudden, January 1456 is where we're going to annex these guys? Doesn't sound right. What, what, what happened there, exactly? Still, there goes two of the nations. Boom! All right, so with them taken care of, at least we have grown substantially. And Sistan is now gone as well. Why do we care about that? Well, because if we go down here to form the Persian nation, there are a few things here, such as... Fars, Khorasan, Luristan, and Ardalan cannot exist. All people that I conveniently already have as vassals. So in order to actually form Persia, I already have to get rid of these guys. And also by getting rid of a lot of the big strong vassals, Liberty Desire is no longer an issue. So by 1456, we have solved our instability problem. The vassals that remain are going to be loyal and we are properly a world power once again. Okay, we should be about to finish annexing Luristan. I already got Ardalan. We've got these guys above 190. It should be pretty much instantaneous. So we'll go ahead and start the annexation process for the rest of my vassals. And at the end of the month, boom, there go all three of them. Hello. Now we get to form Persia. <laughs> Do we want the new traditions and ambitions? Yes, please. Persia's really good. What do these Persian ideas look like? Well, we have 15% more morale of armies and 15% cavalry combat ability right off the bat, not to mention we'll get some better manpower, 10% goods produced, some discipline, caravan power, production efficiency and prestige, development cost reduction, manpower recovery speed, national tax modifier. Yeah, all of this is honestly super solid. Not to mention a huge new mission tree for Persia with this DLC. And you may notice a whole bunch of big question marks on this. Oh, you better believe Persia has a lot of branching missions. Some of these we've already finished simply by consolidating all of Persia, which gets me a ton of claims in a whole bunch of areas, not to mention... <laughs> The reforms of Beber III gives me so much free development. We've also already secured all of Coruscant, which means I get even more of these claims. And we've rallied the warriors, which means I get a really good general with extra shock. Oh yeah, please, that's great. But that's just some of the starting stuff. So what are these branching missions I'm talking about? Well, fun fact, right up over here, for example, patronage of the arts. 
This is something you'll only get access to if you started as the Timurids or one of the successive vassal states and then formed Persia. If we had started off as one of the Koyunlus or Artabil or one of the other little Persian miners up over here of the Mazandaran culture, we'd have totally different missions right here. The patronage of the arts here is, you know, it's okay. We get some uh, prestige turned into monarch power. We get a good artist and stuff. Okay. The real fun is if you can get to this Legacy of Timur, which is going to give you a new reform option, which is a core creation cost reduction of 5%. Not nearly as good as the 25% of the Mughals, but, you know, it helps offset things a little bit. We've also got missions that are sent us toward the Caucasus Mountains. We've got claims that are going to head us toward India and so on. But here's the real fun thing, right? We have something here called our religious direction. Now, this is the largest of the branching paths. If I can get myself an Inquisitor or a Theologian, and I have some privileges given to the Alemma, we get to decide if I'm going to go down the Muslim branches or a Zoroastrian unique mission tree branch. Woohoo! We can get an alliance with the Ottomans. I will take it. It's always good to have big friends that you can use to beat up the Mamluks. Who, by the way, are actually really fun in this patch. They got pretty strong. And to make matters even more interesting, we now can swap out one of our advisors for an Inquisitor or the Theologian, but we'll go with the Inquisitor here, and I'll go ahead and boost you up for more power. And that means we now can go for our religious directions. Gain access to the Muslim or to the Zoroastrian missions. Now, normally, right, you'd see all these different branches, and you gotta do a bit of research. Figure out exactly what you're gonna do. However, a cool thing they decided to do with branching patches this time around is we can actually preview the mission branches and see exactly what we are working with. So this would be the Shia mission tree, which is slightly different from the Sunni mission tree with their own different Persian influence mechanics to bring people into a sphere of influence and so on. But where we're interested in is the Zoroastrian mission tree right here. Reborn in fire. Build the fire temples. Oh yeah, oh yeah, lots of unique stuff that we can only get if we go down this route. So with this selected, we're gonna click this little check mark right here, and boom, we have now made our decision. Once under the ancient Zoroastrian reign of the Sasanian Empire, the region of Persia fell to the Muslim onslaught, and a lot of people abandoned the teachings of Zoroaster in favor of the faith of the conquerors. But they have forgotten their heritage. We must bring them back. This is gonna lead to an event chain, which can lead to the changing of our state religion to Zoroastrianism, but likely antagonize the Muslims. We also are unable to send any missionaries of any kind until this event chain is complete. So now, we're locked in. Ah, here comes the first of these events. In the recent times, the texts and documentations of the ancient Zoroastrian religion have found new popularity within the Persian court. Although intended as a Sunni study of theology, it's clear that some people are indeed liking this idea of free choice within the faith. So we could promote the studies and anger the ulema or tolerate it in secret. I don't see anything here that says that if we tolerate it in secret that this ends the event chain, but it would make sense to me that we need to promote the studies, because this is kind of supposed to be like a mini disaster. So let's promote it. Here's another one. The prophet of Zabzevar. In the midst of a large crowd of people stand a single man on an improvised pedestal. The Sunni ways are wrong, misinterpreted for centuries. Obviously the man is spreading heretic thoughts. They want immediate execution. Nah, I think we go ahead and invite this guy into the court and really upset the ulema. Oh no, some zealots rose up. I was ready for them. Kill them all! This follows up with another very long event. So let's see, at long last the prophet has arrived. Little did I expect the Shah and Shah will listen to what I have to share. Oh my. Unsurprisingly, this will make people very angry. Let's go ahead and have some more religious zealots. And it would appear that my ruler has been successfully converted. Ooh. A question of faith. For a long time, our personal convictions have been at odds with the religious establishment. Do we make our capital into a Zoroastrian city, costing me almost all of my stability and losing a lot of legitimacy in the eyes of the people? Yeah, actually, that's exactly what we do. Boom. We are now officially a Zoroastrian nation. Haha, <laughs> this gets me some trade efficiency. Tolerance, but means that our missionaries are a little on the weak side, which is uh, one of the reasons I kind of feel like we have to get things like religious ideas if we want to stand a chance at converting our people. It also means our ICTA government is gone. Instead, we are going to go for the Asha monarchy. So this is actually really good because we get some development cost reduction, a little bit of missionary strength back, decent tolerance of true faith, two more monarch admin skill, yes please, and more innovativeness. 
Oh, ho, 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 ho. More monarch skill and admin is great. Of course, this now means I have a huge empire that I need to convert, and only one province is already Zoroastrian. Harat, amazingly, did not convert, you know, despite everything that everyone else is saying. So what we're going to do is go ahead and send some missionaries, but you know one thing I could do that makes this even simpler? Let's go ahead and just do some autonomous stuff. This is a new feature. We have autonomous missionaries, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Paradox. I hate to spend all my admin power getting my stability back up, by the way. That is truly abysmal, but okay. So anyway, now that we are officially Zoroastrian, we just need to get rid of some rebels, and we can go ahead and pick up something that will give us at least some of that stability back. Now it says, finish this after completing the event chain, and we would get some extra benefits. Otherwise, if we do it early, we get one stability back. Huh. Are you telling me that the mission tree isn't done yet? Because I kind of assumed the mission was already complete, but maybe not. Oh, there is more. Okay, the Zoroastrian prophet. With the change in Persia's religion, the visions of the old prophet have come to fruition. Ha ha ho. We get a level three theologian to reduce unrest who is very cheap. Okay, also, until the recruited advisor is no longer in our service, we get three missionary strength and two tolerance of the true faith. Also, the religion of Tehran just changed to Zoroastrian and becomes a center of reformation. And we also get the Zoroastrian identity. Ever since the Muslim conquest of the Zagros, the Persian people have been associated with the devotion to Islamic art, architecture, and of course, identity. However, we could instead reform the Sasanian Empire. Woo! You probably would like to know what the new traditions and ambitions are, wouldn't you? Well, I'll show you a screenshot that I took from a test game that I had. So our traditions become morale of armies and diplomatic reputation, okay. More tolerance of the true faith, tech cost reduction, cheaper advisors, cavalry combat ability, caravan power, fort defense and garrison size, and artillery levels to siege. All in all, I'd say actually pretty good, just very different from the Persian ideas. I don't personally think those new national ideas are better than what we already have, so I will go ahead and change to Eren Shar for the fun of it, but we are not going to accept the new traditions and ambitions. And by the way, it does not change your mission tree if that's something you are worried about. But ladies and gentlemen, I just formed a secret never before seen nation in the game, Aran Shar. Look at this. Look at our cool new icon and everything. Of course, the situation is hardly perfect. We're kind of in a state of upheaval right now. I am losing money. I have a lot of rebellion starting to build up. This is gonna be very, very ouchy. And of course, pretty much everyone in the world is about to absolutely hate me since I am the only Zoroastrian nation in the world, but that's one of the reasons. Going for the early religious ideas doesn't seem like a bad idea. Get us to Deus Vault, and we'll be able to start crusading our way across the world. Thankfully, we do at least have a center of conversion, which will speed some things up a little bit. So yeah, by all means, do your thing. Please, for the love of God, convert my land. Honestly, I'm kind of regretting some of what I'm doing right here as far as these conversions. There's kind of a sunk cost fallacy thing going on here. But I actually think I'm gonna go ahead and cancel these, weirdly enough, and the reason why is I want to convert some specific territories in order to get some buffs. So for example, right here in Zanjan, uh, we would be able to get ourselves an extra perk for the Zoroastrian faith. So if I can get over here and convert this, unfortunately this will make absolutely no progress whatsoever, so we would have to go here and pass an edict. Like the missionary strength, it'd be very slow though, very slow. There's another one up over here in Kiva. If we can get this one converted, this would work. Or in Laristan over here. This would also work. This one's a little bit faster than the others. I'm looking for the fastest one I can get. So let's go over here and let's go ahead and pass that edict like so. Okay, by no means are these going to be fast, but at least now we make progress. Well, while we're going through this extremely painful process, let's take a look at the faith itself, because this is kind of fun. So we have here something called Asha Vahishta. It's the name for the divinity and goodness of our actions, our positive energies, good thoughts, good words, good deeds. This is going up passively right now, and the higher it is, the more we can reduce our national unrest, the more manpower we get out of true faith provinces, and in general, we get more power for the three different fires that are available for the Zoroastrian faith. If we can get up to 100 of these faiths, we can activate one of these flames. 
This is gonna give us even more Monarch points, and in this case, more Reform Progress, though it does reduce your Aha Asha Vahishta, I have to remember how to say that, Progress. There's also this one here, which gives us something called a Zoroastrian Invitation, which allows us to request countries very kindly convert to Zoroastrianism. Also, get the Diplo Power and the Development Cost, and then there's, of course, this one for the Military Power, and our own territory gets a Dice Roll Bonus. Remember the whole point of this is that we're supposed to be kind of like positive good guys. Anything that involves, like, breaking alliances and fabricating claims and stuff is generally considered to be kind of mean-spirited and bad. So, basically, everything that's fun in the game is bad. But you know what? It's fine. It's fine. This is a fun challenge. I just got an event where my wife just made Yazd, the only province that's been Zoroastrian for who knows how long convert to Sunni. Gosh dang it, woman! You're actively fighting against my interests! How dare you! Come on, finish with the province. Thank you! Okay, we got one of the holy provinces of Zoroastrianism converted. That means we can now pick a blessing for our faith, and I think the obvious one we want to choose here is going to be the Missionary Strength 2%. Though there are some other good ones here, like, I don't know, Goods Produce Modifier 10% is fantastic. Governing Capacity? I like that too. Honestly, all of them are pretty solid, but yeah, this is the one we're going for. Now we're getting to a more reasonable point here. Okay, thank you. Now what is this? Royal fires until the end of game. Prestige, legitimacy, and manpower in all true faith provinces. Wow. Yeah, I mean, if you can go on a uh, crusading spree, it's pretty strong. We can get the defender of the faith. I mean, since we're the only Zoroastrian nation in the game, it doesn't matter. This just gets me an extra missionary. Sure, toss them onto the pile. Who and the Ottomans have declared their war against the Mamluks. Alrighty, that's something we were looking for. So opportunities for us to attack said Mamluks become pretty attractive. Or Hormuz, they kind of just abandoned the Mamluks, high and dry to die. <laughs> yeah, sure, we could do that too. I said, I feel like it's more important we go ahead and pick up this Divine Supremacy right now so we can get that 3% extra missionary strength. There we go. Now we're finally converting at a reasonable pace. I'm also gonna go ahead and light one of my fires. Why not? Light the fires, lose some of this Asha Vahishta, who cares? We get extra points and reform progress. Oh, for God's sake. Ottomans, I'm already in the middle of my own war. It's not my fault you're losing because you suck. <sighs> all right, now I'm fighting the Mamluks in addition to all of this. That's less than ideal. Wow, we apparently had four of these provinces already under my control. I had no idea. All right, we'll take the construction cost reduction to boost up our... Economy and Daman, controlled by Gujarat at the moment. There it is, Daman over here in India? Oh, and it's been converted to Zoroaster- what? Hold on. The fires were lit in all these other people's countries, true? Oh, now that is interesting. Well, it's not gonna get me any benefit for at least a little while, but still, that's kinda cool. Ooh, if you can get up to stability level two, spend a bit of admin power to get extra missionary strength for the rest of the game. Oh, yeah. All right, well, I'm tired of waiting on this. I think I'm just gonna go ahead and pick this up. Let's get the stability. All right, we completed this. I get one more stability. We're now up to positive three. Thank you. Now I need to build a bunch of temples and stuff, and I also need to complete some agendas on behalf of my mobeds. And we completed some missions for the Mobeds, which means I now get even more missionaries for 25 years at least, plus some missionary strength and a tech cost reduction. Nice. So now we have four automated missionaries. God, this is such a nice feature. And this is free, by the way. A lot of the best quality of life features in this uh, DLC. Yeah, totally free with the latest patch. You don't even have to buy the DLC to enjoy them. Just makes the game better in every way. Do you want to light some more fires? Sure, get some Zoroastrian invitations. Maybe we can invite somebody. So for example, invite into our community. There we go. Ooh, this is actually very similar to an interaction that's in the Muslim branch for Persia as well, where you build out that sphere of influence like I was talking about before. But I can spend one of my invitations instead of the whole Persian influence mechanic for the Muslims and just get these guys to join Zoroaster. Oh my gosh, we just converted them. So I actually might be able to just take these guys as a vassal if I try. Oh, easily. Nice. Now here's something I did not expect about Eren Shar. All right, so we're about to get another idea group. Apparently we count as like a theocracy? We can get divine ideas. Interesting. Wielders of the flaming sword pairs up with religious ideas. Well, that just makes sense. I think we even get a special tier four state reform. Embrace the concept of free will. It does say that this has to do with Zoroaster specifically. 
Though, it enables the Three Fires ability, which I, I already have, right? That That is this ability, yes? So I'm not totally sure why I would want this, except Heretic and Heathen Provinces do not give any penalties? What? Wow, that... That's good, at least until later when I fully converted everybody. Yeah, that just gave me a few extra ducats per month, a whole bunch of manpower. Basically, the penalty of being the wrong faith is a non-thing. Ooh, this is actually fascinating. I'm, I'm basically treated as if I have full religious unity, even though I totally don't. I bet you that's actually really impactful when you get to the age of absolutism if you have not managed to convert all your provinces. Now, what is this? I can propagate religion as Zoroastrian? Really? Convert provinces of a trade node, 28 more can be converted. Really? In Samarkand? Huh. Okay, sure, let's use this to try and promote my religion in this entire trade node. Good lord, I can even do that in Persia proper. Seven provinces can be converted. I mean, let's just, let's just try. I didn't even think about this. I assumed it only worked for Muslim, but apparently Zoroastrian is included. I'm also kind of amazed that we have not had any issues with coalitions so far in this. I mean, I feel like we should have. We've kind of conquered a whole load of land, am I right? And yet, no one seems to mind. It's one of the advantages of being a large enough empire you can fight on multiple fronts far away from each other. It's pretty darn helpful. Anyway, we have now conquered a good chunk of the Caucasian areas. So that's now done. Georgian slaves in the Persian... <clears throat> you want to redact that Persian empire? We're not Persia. Still, we now do get some additional accepted cultures. Oh, nice. Georgian and Armenian cultures are now, like, just part of the empire. That's pretty cool. We have also built temples all over the empire, which means now I get a whole load of free base tax. Yay! And I've purified the holy sites. Converting provinces to missionaries no longer reduces your Asha Vahishta. Nice. And that's helpful because I'm constantly running out of Asha Vahishta. I need this thing to grow fast because one of my other missions is to actually use all of the flames at least once, and then use all of them at least five times in total, at which point we get an upgrade for this ability. I don't know what kind of an upgrade we would get, but that sounds neat. Oh, the Ottomans broke their alliance with me. That's usually foreshadowing of bad things to come. Whatever, we've now got Deus Volt. That means I can go to war with anyone, anywhere, all the time at all. Feels like this thing's getting even more powerful, even more claims than before. Why am I getting so many claims? Good lord. Do I just start getting claims on literally everything that borders me? Is that how this works now? Because that's great. Now this took a little bit of effort, but check it out. Zoroastrian is now permeating throughout my entire empire. <laughs> that actually means we fulfilled another mission where we can uh, integrate the Muslims, which is to say we uh, kind of got rid of all of them, but there we go. Boom, that's taken care of. And we can move on to the Zoroastrian community, where I need to have 15 countries be Zoroastrian. Oh, really? Because, like, I, I, shy of inviting people into the religion, I don't see this happening, like, ever. But it needs to if we want to move on to an Asha Empire, which, for the rest of the game, cost of advisors with my culture and all development cost in my culture gets reduced. Huh. Also, the three fires abilities would generate 50 monarch points of their respective type. Well, good god, I could just keep pressing the button to get a bunch of free monarch points. Whoops, I blinked. I apparently played all night, and now it is 1567. How does this keep happening with EU4? I don't know, I get sucked in. Anyway, you can see that we have grown rather dramatically. I control pretty much all of Iran, plus Kazakh, a lot of Arabia, and I've even fought a couple of wars against the Ottomans and won. They are completely boxed in. And I'm now only two cities away from being able to complete the legacy of Timur. And I want to show you guys this, so what do you guys think? One more war against the Ottomans, for good measure? I think the answer is yes. Honestly, so far so good. I mean, yeah, the fact that the Mamluks fell and became a vassal of the Ottomans is a little unfortunate, but they're not much of a threat here. Tunis is no threat, France is barely getting involved, and I'm using the Commonwealth as a punching bag. These are the meta strats. Ha! Huh, I even got Constantinople. All right, you're wrecked, son. That takes care of the war against the vassals, since you can separate piece them. It's a little bit of a weird relationship, but now I'm actually getting a foothold into Egypt. Excellent. Oh, and the Ottomans actually just annexed Egypt as well. Well, that's hilarious. And stack wipe on the Ottomans. Goodbye, their entire army is gone. <laughs> Peace out, France. And now I have 100% war score. Well, 99 to use against the autos. 
<laughs> is this going to create a giant coalition for me? Most likely, but I accept this challenge because now I have freed the Mashriki people, which means I am indeed a Seljuk successor. Cool, we get some manpower back. Turkish is now an accepted culture. This is surprisingly similar to the Mughals and the ability to just integrate lots of cultures, just built into the mission tree. Not to mention, I now can complete that legacy of Timur, which we only get because I started off as the Timurids or one of their successors. And now I get that 5% core creation cost change to my government platform, and I want to take a look at the special modifier we can get. The State of Conquerors. We have to spend 50 admin power, but by doing this, for the next 20 years, we are going to get another 10% core creation cost reduction, which comes at a pretty good time right about now. The big downside here is the Diplo power loss. This one does kind of suck, but if you find yourself needing to get a lot of admin power for a lot of coring, I could see something like this being pretty good. What I don't know is if this is something you refresh. Does it come back every 20 years or is it just a one-time thing? Regardless, just for fun, I'll go ahead and give it a go. Perfect. And it does look like it is a repeatable thing. Okay, so if you're willing to lose the Diplo power and you have 50 admin power to spend, this could be treated almost like a permanent or at least situational 10% extra core creation cost reduction. Wow, that's a lot of pretty dang cheap land, guys. I'm not gonna lie, that is pretty good at this stage of the game. And we are an incredibly stable nation as well. Yeah, I just want to make the point here that I really do think that if you start off as the Timurids, once you factor in that extra core cost reduction that's passive here, plus a situational 10% here, we're competitive, if not better, than the Mughals. You may say, why? They still have another 10% core creation cost reduction on you. Yeah, that's certainly true, but don't forget, I can basically, for the rest of the game, get an extra plus one admin power here. This thing triggers every, like, 9 to 10 years and lasts for 10 years. And, and, if I can create enough little tiny Zoroastrian states where I can get down here for the Asha Empire, that means I get 50 points every time I click the button. So every 10 years, I get 50 admin power, which basically funds keeping this thing up permanently if I so desire. Plus, I'm generating a lot of extra monarch points every freaking month. I think that the math will work out that this is competitive, if not better than the Mughals. Not to mention, if you stick with the Persian ideas, the military and economic ideas are just straight out better than the Mughals. So a lot of cultural integration through missions, equivalent, if not better, admin power savings with our Zoroastrian system, plus incredibly good Persian ideas. Guys, this might be a top tier nation here. I might be wrong. I'm open to someone doing the math and showing in the late game, it doesn't matter. But we are stupidly strong right now with claims all over the dang place. And we're gonna only get better from here. This is incredibly good. And this is a fun mission tree. We haven't even bothered with some of the economic development down over here yet, because I need to store up 4,000 ducats. Super duper cool. Of course, you guys are gonna have to watch some videos by Zlevik or maybe Slate from the social streamers to find some different ways you can play out with Persia, going down either the Shia or the Sunni branch over here, starting as, let's say, Artabil or somebody else. Also incredibly powerful. Persia is very top tier right now. This is fun. But you know what? I got to say that I am the first person to ever form proper Eren Shar in vanilla EU4. No mods, Eren Shar exists. I didn't even know this was a thing when I agreed to do this video, so this is pretty darn awesome. Once again, thank you to Paradox Interactive for the sponsorship for today's video. I had a lot of fun with this. Of course, you guys can find out more about the DLC, King of Kings, when it releases on November 6th, and there will be a link in the description down below. Otherwise, I would ask you to hit that like button, leave a comment, subscribe, make sure you hit that notify bell, and I will see you guys next time.